Now, more backlash from those opposed to an Indigenous voice to Parliament after South Australia became the first Australian jurisdiction to introduce the bill to their Parliament. Tony Abbott wrote in The Australian today, this is very far indeed from the modest change the PM claims it is. It's actually by far the biggest constitutional change we've ever been asked to make. It's not just adding to the powers of the federal parliament, but actually changing the way we are governed. A very strong piece from Tony Abbott, and I recommend you reading it if you haven't already. And here was our former Prime Minister John Howard speaking with Chris Kenny on Thursday night. When you are talking about a body that can make recommendations to every part of the federal government and the potential for those recommendations being litigated if they're rejected, I think you've gone into a new constitutional quagmire. An editor-at-large for the Australian newspaper, Paul Kelly, says the model Anthony, Anthony Albanese has chosen just won't work. In his piece, he wrote, the Australian tragedy of 2023 is about to unfold. He writes, it's a tragedy because the Australian constitution needs to recognise the Indigenous people and what they rightly call the torment of our powerlessness, yet the Albanese cabinet decision is an extraordinary and flawed model devoid of bipartisanship or any effort to achieve it. Incredible piece. Joining me now live from Canberra is Chief Political Correspondent for The Australian, Jeff Chambers. Jeff, look, this is emerging as a very serious issue. We've now heard from two former Prime Ministers in Tony Abbott and John Howard, also The Australian's um, former Editor-in-Chief, The Australian's Editor-at-Large, Paul Kelly. What are the concerns that they're outlining here about the model Anthony Albanese is progressing with? I think the, uh, the, one of the central concerns is in relation to the inclusion of executive government. So when we first heard about this, it was a voice to parliament, and that's been expanded to a voice to parliament and executive government. Now, what we saw last week with the amendment was the addition, a key addition of another word, which says executive government of the Commonwealth. And what that means is that we're going to now see other jurisdictions across the country some who are pretty keen to get a consistent framework in how this works. Uh, and and we'll, we've already seen this in South Australia. They've moved ahead uh, via legislation, not changes to any constitutions. Um, but we're going to see, you know, we've already seen in Victoria a move to a voice and a treaty. Um, so across the country, we're going to have this patchwork approach. Uh, and, and the big concern that Greg Craven and others have raised is in relation to the powers of this body and the potential for legal challenges in the High Court. So uh, can this body, for example, on the safeguard mechanism, uh, climate change policy, policy that everyone's been talking about today, um, and the impact, for example, on coal and gas projects, could the voice to Parliament potentially, uh, you know, see uh, the, uh, you know, various groups, um, you know, opposing certain projects? And what kind of direct access do they have to bureaucrats. Now, the government has... We've got a lot of questions, very limited answers, and it seems like the Prime Minister uh, is really trying to advocate on a vibe rather than provide any specific detail in relation to some of the um, unforeseen circumstances that could arise. Peter Dutton has demanded or asked that the Solicitor General's advice on this issue be released publicly. Anthony Albanese was on radio this morning uh, saying that he wasn't going to do that. He asked Australians to trust him, uh, that it was very constitutionally and, and legally solid and sound. But, Jeff, you know, we have eminent judges on the High Court who have uh, very heated debates about whether something is or isn't constitutionally sound. Wouldn't it have been a better approach for the Labor leader to sit down first with the coalition, come to a model that would have bipartisan support and then have both sides of Parliament take that to the people rather than, at the moment, what's looking like... It's, it's very questionable whether it's going to succeed later this year and it would be devastating for the Indigenous community if it doesn't succeed. Well, I, I think it's increasingly political and... Uh... And Anthony Albanese has made it very clear um, that this is now a, a direct contest. And by pressing ahead, in a, in a sense, retrofitting uh, what that final amendment looked like, because you've got to remember in July last year at the Gama Festival, um, Anthony Albanese 
uh, released this amendment and what we saw last week was very slight tweaks to those. So we went through this long process uh, and the constitutional um, reference group that was set up uh, last met on February 2 um, and that was not reporting to the government, that was reporting uh, to the uh, working group uh, which then ultimately provided the final um, recommended wording and key design principles which the government and cabinet uh, rubber stamped. So I don't think there's much uh, goodwill from the government's perspective to uh, have a bipartisan approach on this referendum. All right, Jeff, to another big story today, front page of the Australian newspaper, unions in New South Wales are urging new Labor Premier Chris Minns to prioritise lifting public sector wages and conditions. Uh, this, as you know, of course, was one of his main two platforms that he ran on during the campaign, along with privatisation. Look, it's, it's the first Monday, the first working day in the job, and already they're putting pressure on him. Uh, Chris Minns has indicated on Ben Fordham's show this morning that he will start negotiations soon. But, look, it's it's going to be a messy fight if he doesn't give them exactly the sort of wage increase and, and uh, other pay conditions that they're looking for. Oh, look, um, yeah, the, the risk to a Labor Premier in New South Wales is, is always very high. I mean, you could see them marching on Parliament and, and strikes. I'm sure that's not where they want to get to. Um, but, look, he did say as an urgent priority he would look at abolishing the coalition era 3% uh, wage, public sector wage cap. Um, but clearly he's got to get his feet under the desk and uh, have a look at the books and see what's actually possible. Um, because no doubt the unions will start at a high bar and he'll have to uh, um, very early uh, in his government negotiate um, an arrangement that, uh, that, that doesn't sort of cook the books. Now, Jeff, take us to Canberra. Um, this week in Parliament, Anthony Albanese is again fighting to pass the $10 billion Housing Australian Future Fund and he's looking for support for other key policies. The government has secured the last-minute support of the Greens for its cornerstone climate policy. Still needs three Senate crossbenchers to take its side when it reaches the Senate, though. Yeah, that, that, that's right. So uh, I think on your show uh, last week, I predicted that the Greens would, would fold on safeguards. And uh, despite Bob Brown and, and other luminaries coming out, uh, he has made that deal. And that deal does not uh, agree to what the Greens' demands were to uh, ban new coal and gas projects. So um, they've, got that, they've got over that hurdle. And I think that they will find those other two crossbenches. So by the end of the week, I expect that safeguards will go through the Senate. Um, the National Reconstruction Fund, it took them a while to find an additional crossbencher there, but I think that will either pass today or tomorrow. But uh, the big challenge is looming as the $10 billion Housing Australia Future Fund. Um, the, the Greens don't like it whatsoever. Um, David Pocock is not a fan. Jackie Lambie has raised some concerns, but I think that they can allay those concerns. Um, so at this point, we've seen a crossbench that's really... Uh, rubber-stamped the Prime Minister's uh, policy agenda through the upper house. Mm. Um, it's going to be really interesting to see uh, if this uh, housing legislation is the, ones that the one that the Greens will, will fight on. And they have linked um, the spend, the $368 billion spend on AUKUS uh, with the housing policy. And they're calling on um, the government to spend something like $5 billion a year um, on social and affordable housing. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll see where we get to. And I chat to you next Monday at this time. Jeff Chambers, Chief Political Correspondent for The Australian. Thanks for your time.